I'll go for the obvious question. How do you get from precious to this? Hmm. Well, the kernel of the idea for Violet and Daisy came before I got the job for Precious. Then I got the job for Precious, put Violet and Daisy on hold, and then returned to it after Precious was through. And what sparked the idea for this? Well, I love so many genres. Uh, the crime genre, the kind of age genre, and uh, you know, I thought uh, exploring those, those genres with uh, young women like Violet and Daisy offered an opportunity for a new perspective. And so, uh, you know, so many great things have been done in the crime genre and in the uh, coming of age genre. I thought, well, maybe this is a chance to have a, a new perspective and uh, explore some different layers. And uh, you definitely have a lot of different layers here between comedy, some really straight drama, and almost like a fantastical element to it too, mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm -hmm. How do you go about combining all of them while making them all work by themselves and together? I think when you're combining a lot of ideas or um, blending several genres, I think the key is to have uh, an overarching theme throughout. And this movie deals primarily with uh, friendship, love, uh, regret, and redemption. And that keeps the, the focus, no matter how uh, wild or startling or uh, funny uh, hopefully moving these moments are. You brought up the friendship being the heart of this so can you tell me a little bit about casting the two of them because I mean that chemistry kind of makes the movie. Mm. Yes, yeah, so I'm very very fortunate to uh, get uh, Sir Sharon and, and Alexis Bledel uh, you know I they responded uh, to the script and I was fortunate enough to get them. And they are both remarkable talents with uh, these extraordinary qualities about them. And in this piece, I think you'll see new sides to them. Uh, and, you know, uh, actors are artists too and they have uh, vast repertoires that they often you know, may not get a chance to fully shown. And so you'll see new sides of Alexis, you'll see new sides of Sergio, you'll see new side, a new side of uh, James Gandolfini here. And uh, you know, we knew we were making uh, something of a world of its own, and we all just dove in head first, and, uh, and we'll see what happens. I can't wait to see what people think of of, of the great work these actors have done here. And was it just about, you know, making your list and reaching out to talent, or was there ever any trying to, you know, fit the pieces together hmm. in terms of, like, matching people up, or did that opportunity not arise? Well, primarily, uh, we would try to match uh, the actor uh, to the character, and when casting a film, things just seem to come together. Uh, they land, oftentimes they just land in the right place. And uh, I really think uh, that happened here. But there are so many incredibly talented actors who came in and uh, I was trying to figure out ways to expand uh, the universe or add characters because I wanted to work with them so badly. But hopefully I'll get that chance at some point. You could have added a number 10 in there. I added a number 10. <laughs> It's funny, you know, with, uh, with storytelling. I think in the best case scenario, you get to a place where, you know, the, uh, the story speaks back to you and, and tells you what it wants and needs as much as uh, you tell it. Can you tell me a little bit about the choice to use the scene headings too? Because mm -hmm. I found that really interesting because it kind of established a pace, but at the same time, each scene is a different length. And mm -hmm. then I saw the correlation between the numbers a little. Mm -hmm. So what was going through your mind when you put that in here? Well, this story has a, uh, a fable-like quality to it. And those breaks uh, have a communicate the storybook sort of feel. But they, uh, they give you a mental breath 
to reflect upon what you've seen and to anticipate what will come next. So I think they added to the storybook and heightened, heightened reality, quality of the movie. They also functioned a little like really short, nice and tight short films in mm. a way. It felt like that, like they could have stood on their own. Wow, oh, thank you. I certainly made plenty of short films since I was very young and uh, to me they were a big part, or a big part of my life through so many years of, uh, of learning and, and trying to uh, get into the industry keep working on my craft and exploring and experimenting. So I would recommend that anybody make as many short films as possible. Did you get the chance to experiment on this at all while you're working on it? Because like there's tons of action guns and blood here. So I imagine, you know, you get someone all bloody, you gotta reset. So is there any flexibility in terms of playing around with that? Well, I think uh, you know a lot of the spirit of play originally comes in, in writing the script and then uh, you, know, you hope to fulfill that and accept what comes to you on the, on the set. If, if, uh, if a playful idea arises, uh, you know, going in prepared uh, makes it easier to incorporate that idea. And so you know, the playful spirit of the film uh, is due in part to that. And it has a lot of different uh, tones, starts and ends in starkly different places. And you, know, you hope that uh, that exploration is uh, uh, all serving uh, the larger idea and the larger themes that you're working with. But film is such a remarkable art form and there are so many things it can do that it, it's a joy to explore those dimensions, but not just for the sake of exploration, but uh, in an effort to better tell your story. And did you shoot this on film? Yes, yes, That is a very interesting choice. Can you tell me about that? <laughs> well, uh, this was shot on anamorphic 35 millimeter film. And uh, it's becoming a rare thing these days. But, uh, you know, I shot on film all throughout film school. And digital technology is incredible. And it will get to the place of film uh, one day. And perhaps not in the uh, too distant future. But the amount of information that lies within all of those layers of emulsion uh, is remarkable and you know, they can be pulled out to varying degrees. When you uh, combine that with a digital internet work. So here I, I thought film would serve this story very well uh, because film has that dreamlike quality and so does this film. So. Uh, but I think the ideas and the inspiration are priceless. And more important than the format upon which you shoot. I've been keeping an eye on Attica because I'm very excited about that. Can you give me a little update on it? Is it going to go into production soon? Um, well, we've uh, been working on it uh, and you know, Doug just shot a film, another film, and with our busy schedules, we've managed to get a lot of work done on it and visit uh, the facility in upstate New York, and uh, we're thrilled about it. And we can't wait to really, really get into the uh, this amazing story that really gripped the entire country at the time, you know. How much of that story is it going to cover? Because you have all of the build-up to the actual uprising, the uprising, the four-day span of it, and then you have all the aftermath, like mm -hmm. with families 
and, and just like the community reaction, are we going to get that part of it too? Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have, as it is now, we're planning to have all of those elements and uh, to varying degrees and all of those elements are important when you look at the event. You know, the aftermath is, is just as important as, as what led up to it for sure. So um, it's a big story with a lot of characters and uh, a lot of uh, heroes and, and villains on every side. It uh, has a great complexity, as does life, and so you know, trying to capture that story as, uh, as faithfully uh, as we can.